I'm very happy uh, to welcome you to the fourth part of our family education series, which today is going to address the topic, reducing risk for Alzheimer's disease, lifestyle changes, and more. I'm happy to introduce myself, Dr. Cordula dick Mielke. I'm the Director of Education here at UCI Mind, and Dr. Malcolm Dick, who is the senior neuropsychologist here at UCI Mind for our Memory Assessment and Research Center. So um, I never know when Cordula says a senior neuropsychologist, whether that's related to my age or experience. <laughs> I don't know. All righty. Somebody already asked me tonight if we were going to uh, be making any jokes, and I uh, told them I was deferring that to you, Malcolm. So. You've uh, made them happy. Uh, many of you may have heard of this idea of successful aging. Um, all of us would like to uh, live healthy, long lives with good quality of life. And so um, the theorists who write about successful aging talk about three different parts to that. Um, the first one being minimizing um, diseases and disability and your risk for those, maximizing your physical and mental abilities, and that's really something we're going to talk a lot about today, and engaging in an active life. Here at um, UCI Mind, we spend a lot of effort researching how to age successfully. So why do some people develop Alzheimer's disease or another dementia like frontotemporal dementia or dementia with Lewy bodies, but other people live long lives into their 90s and be beyond uh, and remain cognitively healthy until death. Um, we invite any of you that are interested to participate in our research and today you were handed or found on your seat a little card this little card right here. And if anybody um, wants to be on our newsletter, anybody's interested in participating in our research, we invite you to fill this out and to hand this back in on your way out the door. Um, we are actually looking for healthy older adults and people with very mild memory loss that will be part of our research study. And I wonder if the people that are in the audience that are part of the research study already will raise their hands, because I know we've got some people in the audience that are part of our research study. And they, yep, quite a few. And they actually come in every year. Um, and we follow um, their health. And we follow particularly their cognitive health across time. And then. Uh, upon death, our research volunteers also donate their um, brains. Um, in order to be part of the study, we just ask that you uh, bring a study partner, someone who can come along and also provide feedback about you, and that you agree to brain donation upon death. And people um, who are part of our study receive these annual evaluations at no cost. And it's great. Um, it's great because the participants uh, if you're healthy, you get to monitor your cognitive health and we find changes and pick them up early and get you into treatment if you do happen to develop mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. And if you're in our memory loss group, um, we follow you and you also get to participate in studies and have access to clinical trials that you might not have otherwise. So um, I've already mentioned a few of these benefits, but one of the great things is that you do get access to experts and you also get the pleasure of knowing that you're contributing to research and you're helping to move us towards um, a cure. Do you have to have somebody year-round for you or just once a year to come to see you? Once a year. Um, once a year. Uh, People who are our research volunteers come in to the center and they are evaluated and then they do bring a study partner at that time. And then we also encourage those um, research volunteers to get engaged in other studies being done here on campus uh, on the topic of Alzheimer's disease and healthy aging. So, um, 
So, you know, this is the perfect presentation to talk about this because it's really our research volunteers that help us make it possible for us to study and understand what helps us reduce risk for Alzheimer's disease. Why do some people age and stay cognitively healthy, which is what you all want. This is our most popular talk every year, so you're here and you want that. And what, um, what happens to people who do develop a dementia. So um, in our family education series, we've covered these three topics already this year. Uh, we did an overview of the dementias uh, in March. We talked about dementia treatment in June, current medications and also investigational therapies. And in September, we talked about the behavioral and psychiatric issues that emerge in dementia and how to manage them. Now, all of those presentations are online uh, at our website, and you have the address there and on your handout, and you can go view any of those. So we aren't going to be uh, covering that material again this evening. So we will, however, just briefly say again um, what these terms mean, because for those of you that are new, it's very important to understand these terms, dementia, mild cognitive impairment, and Alzheimer's disease. Dementia is a syndrome. It involves three major characteristics. It's not a disease, it's a syndrome. And the three characteristics are loss of intellectual ability, your memory plus one or more other cognitive abilities are affected, so that might be language, reasoning, judgment, visual spatial abilities, and the impairment is so severe that it interferes with your everyday activities. Alzheimer's disease happens to be the main cause of dementia, so it's good to think about dementia as a big umbrella term, much like the term cancer, big umbrella term, but there are a lot of different types of cancers, lung cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, a long list of causes of cancer. Same thing with dementia, big umbrella term, and there are many causes of dementia. Alzheimer's disease just happens to be the most common cause. Alzheimer's disease, going from healthy, to al from healthy aging to Alzheimer's disease, isn't like falling off a cliff either. You're not healthy one day and have Alzheimer's disease the next. It's a progression and transition from healthy aging to Alzheimer's disease. And we now call this transitional state mild cognitive impairment. It's a state, a mild cognitive impairment greatly increases your risk for developing dementia. Well, what are some of the pathological changes that occur in Alzheimer's? Because a lot of the interventions a lot of the interventions that we'll be talking about are designed to sort of attack or uh, try to influence some of these pathological changes. This is uh, two examples of a brain. Uh, these are brains from actually our clinic uh, tissue repository and they're the same age individuals. They're both women in their late 60s. And this is the brain of the lady who had Alzheimer's disease, and this is of a normal older adult. And just looking at the two top images, you can see some changes. One of the, the most obvious changes is some shrinkage in the brain. And as we all get older, just like we shrink in terms of our height, uh, we also shrink in terms of our muscle mass, well, our brain also shows some shrinkage. Not a great deal in a healthy adult, but the brain of a 70-year-old is going to look a lot different than the brain of a 18, 20-year-old. So we can see evidence of this atrophy, and this is the front of the brain, and this is the back, and this area along the side is a temporal lobe that would be involved in learning and memory. And you can see the size of the temporal lobe in a healthy adult compared to someone who has died of Alzheimer's disease. The major changes, however, that we look for in Alzheimer's are microscopic changes that you can't see with the naked eye. And you have to stain, slice the brain and stain the tissue with certain chemicals to bring out these 
pathological features, which are called senile plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. And this is, uh, these circled areas are the senile plaques, and these are composed of sort of waxy, sticky substances that are made up of a particular abnormal protein called beta amyloid. And then these little flame-like projections, those are called neurofibrillary tangles, and they're made up of a different protein called tau. But it's believed that these plaques and tangles, we don't know if they cause Alzheimer's disease or just sort of are hallmarks or um, consequences of the disease. But we do know that as we all get older, we'll start to have some plaques in our brain. The more plaques you have, the more likely it's going to be correlated with poor scores on, say, your cognitive tests or tests of functional abilities. So um, the number of people affected by Alzheimer's disease is going to grow dramatically over the next 40 years. Today, there are 5.4 million Americans affected by Alzheimer's disease, and by 2050, there will be at least 13.5 million uh, affected and perhaps as many as 16 million affected. This means that the number of people in our nation with this disease is going to triple in the next uh, 40 years. Um, and here, when we look at the number of Californians specifically, 10 percent of all people with Alzheimer's disease live in the state of California, about 588,000 today. By 2030, which is a mere 17 years away, 1.1 million people, over 1.1 million Californians will be affected. I think a very important fact is that today we know that for every one person with Alzheimer's disease, there are at least three close family members or friends involved in their care. So we need to add to that 1.1 million people another 3.3 million caregivers uh, in terms of the number of Californians affected by this disease. Here in Orange County, we're similarly going to see a doubling of the number of people with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, again, just in the uh, next decade and a half. Now, this represents people with the disease uh, itself. The Alzheimer's Association estimates that we also include people with mild cognitive impairment. We have at least 75,000 people in Orange County that either already have the disease or at very high risk of developing it. One of the groups that is going to be hard hit by mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease are the baby boomers. And the baby boomers were individuals born just right after World War II, 1946, through about 1964. And um, you probably heard that essentially every day for the next 19 years, 10,000 baby boomers in the United States are reaching age 65. So this is a rapidly aging group, and we do know that roughly one in every eight individuals who are in this age group are going to develop Alzheimer's disease, and roughly one out of every six is going to have some kind of a dementia. So this group is going to make a big contribution to that increasing arc that Cordula showed you. So today we're going to focus on your risk for Alzheimer's disease. So the first thing we need to uh, just be clear is that there are some risk factors that we can't change, and there are some that we can. So it's the gene, uh, you know, it's the nature-nurture uh, debate. How much of our risk is from, for example, genetics versus how much is due to lifestyle factors or environment? So we're going to focus today on the risks that you can impact um, to help reduce your chance of developing Alzheimer's disease. So um, this slide just uh, shows us that we all have certain risk factors that are pushing us towards um, cognitive decline. Some of those risk factors might be, again, genetics, uh, socioeconomic status, our occupational exposure, 
our life habits, um, vascular risk factors like heart disease, di diabetes, depression. These are risk factors that are pushing us towards cognitive decline. There are other factors, protective factors, that are going to um, help us maintain our cognitive functioning. Those would be things like high education, diet, physical, mental activity. Um, so we're going to be um, talking about managing our risk factors and also about some things that we can do proactively to protect our brains. So as I said, um, there so, are two types of risks we're going to talk about that you can change, medical <laughs> risks and then lifestyle risks, and we'll start with the medical ones. So we can't stop, science isn't at a point where we can stop a person from developing Alzheimer's or prevent its occurrence. But we do know ways of perhaps reducing the risk, as Cordula mentioned, and one of the big there is one of the big risks that seems to have a lot of evidence supporting it is trying to address cardiovascular risks. Interestingly, when you look at individuals who have died of dementia and they come to autopsy and many of them were diagnosed as having vascular dementia, meaning dementia due to multiple strokes in the brain, the vast majority of them, they may have strokes, but the vast majority also have Alzheimer's disease. So we do know that cardiovascular risks are a risk for developing the disease. And the first one we're going to talk about is hypertension. And so um, this is just to um, focus you. Many of you, um, uh, I hope all of you in this room uh, know your blood pressure. How many of you here have hypertension? Anybody who has hypertension? Okay. So. Um, you'll know that the number we're shooting for is 120 over 80. And our systolic blood pressure, or the top number, is the force um, exerted when the heart muscle contracts to pump blood um, throughout our body. The bottom number, the diastolic blood pressure, it represents um, the force of blood flow when the heart is resting in between beats. So between in terms of the top number, which is really important for you to focus on in terms of this presentation, if you're between 120 and 139, that's considered prehypertension. 140 or above is hypertension. So today, 42 million Americans are hypertensive. And um, the sad thing is that only about a fourth of those people, you'll notice, have their hypertension under control. And there are a lot of things that we can do to actually control hypertension, uh, apart from uh, medication, as you can see, a lot of the causes for hypertension are things we can really have an impact on. We can't impact our family history, but we certainly can impact our weight, how much alcohol we use, how much salt we use. Uh, we're going to talk more about insulin resistance, but this has to do with maintaining our blood sugar level. We can impact a sedentary lifestyle. We can impact um, stress. Um, so uh, hypertension, we know, increases our risk for developing a, a dementia anywhere from two to five times, as you can see uh, in this slide. Marked hypertension here, we're talking about uh, the top number, systolic number being at 160 or above. When? In midlife, today. Right now, in my, as a middle, person of middle age, having marked hypertension increased my risk dramatically. And even that borderline hypertension would double risk. And prehypertension, as you can see, even if you're not hypertensive at that 140 or above, um, increases your risk by 25%. Um, this is uh, another study which uh, we uh, focuses actually on diastolic blood pressure, um, which again shows that watching that lower number is important as well. Um, you can see in this study of almost 20,000 middle-aged uh, older adults that risk um, for cognitive impairment increased 7% for every increment of 10 points, that diastolic 
uh, blood pressure went up. So uh, diastolic hypertension accelerates ar arteriosclerotic changes in the brain. So it's something we also want to watch. What's important here, though, is that treating hypertension actually brought down risk. That's why it's so sad that so few people um, <clears throat> uh, control their hypertension, because in individuals who controlled their hypertension, their risk fell from 4.3, so 4.3 times greater risk, to just 1.2. Um, and anti-tensive uh, hypermedications also reduce dementia risk due to heart failure. The other cardiovascular risk that needs to be addressed is cholesterol. And just like Cordula asked with regarding to your blood pressure, how many of you actually know your total cholesterol level? Probably, really, only about half of you. How many, how many of you know your uh, good and bad cholesterol levels? Okay. Okay, quite a good, about again, about half of you. So, uh, <coughs> cholesterol, you probably know, is um, a sort of a fatty substance. It's called a lipid that circulates in our blood. And cholesterol is actually very important for the functioning of our neurons, the brain. And it's also involved in steroids and sex hormones and reproduction. So it's an important uh, process. And usually our liver manufactures most of the cholesterol that we need, but we also get cholesterol through animal products in our diet. And there's two types of the cholesterol. Uh, you can go back. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> so there's two types, the good cholesterol, which is called HDL, and you can think of the H as sort of like referring to healthy and the LDL, the bad cholesterol, where the L is referring to like lethal. <laughs> and the bad cholesterol is the cholesterol that sort of clogs the arteries. It attaches to the inside wall of the arteries and forms blockages. And so that over time can narrow the vessel, so you get less and less blood and oxygen flowing to different parts of the brain. The good cholesterol what it does is it tries to take the bad cholesterol off the artery walls, take it down to the liver where it's processed and gotten rid of. These, the next slide, shows some of the levels that we typically want. And you can see that with the total cholesterol, you want it under 200. And then there's various ranges of good, desirable, or borderline or high for the LDL and the HDL. So may, next time you go to the doctor, ask for that report after you get for your blood tests and look at this handout and see where you are compared to those numbers. So the, as I mentioned, the cholesterol is very important for the functioning of our nervous system and many of the um, organs of the body. But actually our brain is probably uh, about 25% of the cholesterol is in our brain even though the brain is probably only maybe about 2 to 3 percent of our total body weight, but it has 25 percent of the cholesterol. And the cholesterol is very important for the functioning of the brain cells. It's a key part of what's called the myelin sheath, which is sort of like an insulation that flows along the neuron. It allows information or electrical impulses to travel more quickly. If you don't have enough cholesterol produced, you can cause, it can cause problems with uh, the myelin sheath dis disintegrating, and MS, for example, is related to that. Uh, but the main problem that we're talking about with the cholesterol is sort of the buildup of plaques in the arteries, which essentially chokes off blood to the brain. That not only can cause cognitive changes, but it can also increase the risk for stroke, hemorrhages, um, other types of deficits. All right, he's passing the ball over to me. So what about the relationship of 
cholesterol to risk for uh, dementia. So you can see, again, what's really important is we're talking about cholesterol levels in midlife. That's why I said knowing your cholesterol and asking your doctor for the report and actually tracking where you are is important because it's really about your health today in terms of how it's going to affect your risk for dementia. So if you had high cholesterol over 250, you are over twice as likely to develop dementia. Now when you combine high cholesterol with borderline hypertension, remember that was 120 to 139, almost three times greater risk. High cholesterol plus marked hypertension um, over 160, 3.5 times greater risk. So again, the higher that systolic or top number in your hyper, uh, in your blood pressure, the greater the risk for developing the dementia in combination with um, high cholesterol is particularly dangerous in terms of risk for dementia. You can see when they looked at patients over a course of 27 years, those who had high cholesterol midlife, they had a 42% increased risk of dementia. So watching your cholesterol, controlling it again is very, very important. Now, um, in terms of uh, HDL in particular, so the goal for HDL, and I'm going to look it up because I have to actually look because I always say the wrong thing. Remember, HDL, healthy cholesterol, we want that below 40. So here, looking at about 4,000 British civil servants, and they're taking measures of cholesterol and short-term memory um, at age 51 and then 61, and they compared levels of HDL. You actually want it above 60. Oh, well, this is wrong then. then no, you, oh, no. hi, oh, okay. I see, I, always, 60, I, read the I read the wrong column. Good, thank you. Above 60. See, you should have done this slide. <laughs> above 60. Um, so the ones with the lowest HDL had a greater um, loss of memory at age 51, and that even um, increased to 53% greater loss of memory at age 61 compared to 55. Um, so um, you can see that participants whose HDL level declined were more likely to show impairment in memory. So that um, shows the importance of keeping it where? Above 60, right? So there's ways that you can control your cholesterol. Obviously, the ones that we're all aware of is through diet and exercise. But when diet and exercise aren't enough, people, your doctor might go ahead and prescribe a statin drug. And these are the most common statins. And uh, statins are typically given primarily to lower the bad cholesterol, the LDL. They have some very modest effects on HDL. So it's not a good way of raising HDL, but it's a good way of lowering the bad cholesterol, the ones that clog the arteries. And the statins are usually the most common one, I think probably one of the most commonly prescribed medicines in the United States, if not the world, is Lipitor. And you typically give these statins at night because your body produces most of the cholesterol at night. Uh, it, they're generally relatively well tolerated. They have few side effects. Um, the doctor often might want to sort of test your liver enzymes just to make sure that they're not being affected and also to be on the outlook for like motor or muscle changes. But for the most part, they're pretty well tolerated. And so one of the ideas is that since we know high levels of cholesterol, just like hypertension is associated with a risk for developing dementia and Alzheimer's, if you gave statins, would statins lower our risk of developing dementia? So uh, there's been a number of studies. We just put uh, the references for a couple of them on the, the slide here. But essentially, when you look at statins as a way of lowering our risk for developing dementia, you get a mixed picture. About half the studies say it's helpful and lower the risk. The other half say there's no benefit in terms of a an adult lowering their risk for dementia by taking a statin. 
Well, but there's still a logic maybe for the reasons why statins might be helpful. Um, for example, we do know that individuals who have a, individuals in animal studies have shown that persons on a high fat diet, a high fat diet, their brains seem to produce more of these amyloid plaques, those sort of circular spheres that I showed you on one of the early slides. And statins would help po possibly to reduce that plaque accumulation. We also know, just from what we've been talking about, is that the bad cholesterol, which is the one affected by the statin, is the cholesterol that sort of blocks the arteries. So if you can control that, you might improve blood flow to the brain, which might therefore result in healthier brain cells. Uh, there's also some evidence that the LDL, when it attaches to the wall of the arteries, it causes inflammation. And there's a growing evidence that in Alzheimer's disease, there's evidence of inflammation in the brain. So possibly uh, the use of a statin might lower inflammation, and that might help. And then finally, and we'll come back to this, there is evidence that the cholesterol can cause oxidative damage to the brain. And we'll talk more about oxidative stress and damage when we talk about uh, antioxidants. So there's a number of reasons why statins could possibly help. However, no doctors in a healthy adult would say, well, we'll put you on a statin a healthy adult who doesn't have a problem with their cholesterol, they wouldn't put you on a statin just a way of, as a way of reducing your risk. But if you have high cholesterol, then on a statin it may be helpful, but the evidence not really very conclusive at this point in time. So another major medical condition that you want to pay attention to is diabetes because research suggests a clear relationship between diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. And um, having diabetes or being pre-diabetic can increase your risk. I'm sure um, you have heard, because it's been broadcast widely, that diabetes is actually epidemic proportions in our nation. Uh, you can see there's been a 41% increase in diabetes since 1997. The numbers are on the slide. Um, there are also large numbers of Americans who are pre-diabetic and we know that uh, much of this is caused by uh, the obesity problem and growing obesity problem we have here in the United States. So this is a world map showing the dramatic increase in diabetes. Again, just in the next 17 years, here in the United States al alone, there's going to be a 34% increase in the number of Americans um, who have a diabetes, and diabetes has many very um, dramatic uh, long-term effects that are negative for your health, including such things as loss of uh, vision. So it's a very um, scary disease in many ways. Look at here in Africa, an 80% uh, increase in diabetes, or in uh, China, 45%. Worldwide, we're going to see this rise in diabetes. So what is diabetes? And this is just a simple explanation of the disease. Basically, uh, diabetes occurs when the body is unable to regulate its own blood sugar. Um, so what's happening is your body either can't produce or it can't use uh, properly the insulin that is needed to convert the food we eat every day uh, into energy for our body. So insulin is a hormone. It helps to, to convert the food into um, the glucose that we need to carry out our everyday activities. So type 1 diabetes is basically what's known as juvenile diabetes, and that is um, when you're born uh, diabetic and your body simply cannot produce insulin. Type 2 diabetes, which is the type of diabetes that is increasing dramatically worldwide um, is known as adult onset diabetes. Any of us could develop it. And in that case, your body's not producing enough insulin or it's not using the insulin it does produce effectively 
and that causes a buildup of sugar in the blood. We know, as I was saying, that diabetes um, uh, leads to many other major health problems, uh, such as listed here on the slide, uh, cardiovascular issues, and it has long been known to be a risk factor for cognitive um, decline. And even if you're not diabetic, but you're in that pre-diabetic zone, um, that can increase your risk for cognitive changes. So when we looked at the relationship, or researchers looked at the relationship between uh, diabetes and Alzheimer's disease, you can see on the slide that diabetes, again, mm -hmm. significantly increased risk, depending on the study. One study showing that it tripled the risk, another showing that um, risk increased 65%. Importantly, just as we talked about with hypertension, if you treat hypertension, you can actually offset the risk. Same thing with diabetes. Um, in this particular study, looking at all older women with diabetes, um, they were more likely to show cognitive impairment, but if they were taking medication, so they were keeping their diabetes under control, they were performing on memory tests as well as women who did not have diabetes. So again, um, this is the importance of uh, controlling these uh, disease states to um, keep your, to stay cognitively healthy. So now we're going to turn to some lifestyle factors um, that all of you uh, can uh, address as needed to help reduce your risk. The first one being in regards to weight and diet. So um, many of the studies that we'll be talking about use BMI. Have all of you heard about BMI? Probably. Um, in your handout, um, there is actually a BMI chart. And so you can see I provided you with the BMI calculation, but it's much easier to use one of these BMI charts. And I'm going to show you how to do that so you can figure out your BMI. You can see that what you're wanting uh, to be is you. You want to be at a normal weight, which is a BMI of 25 or below. Above 25 is overweight. Above 30 is obese. So um, if you've never done this before, the way you find your BMI is number one. You look at your height. So in this case, we're using me as an example. Um, I'm 5 foot 10. And so that's 70 inches. So you have to convert your height to inches. So this is a little mental exercise for you as well. Uh, if you can convert your height to, to inches. Then you go over to find your weight, 153. And then you go back up the chart, whoops, to find your BMI. And my BMI is 22. So I'm well in the healthy zone under that uh, 25. I'm. Uh, in uh, the normal range. So um, in, in terms of thinking about yourself relative to some of the studies we're going to share, uh, you might want to look and see what your BMI is. Um, you know, one of the great contributors to obesity in our nation is that we've supersized just about everything, um, as this cartoon represents. And here in our nation, this is just very recent data from the CDC, you can see how dramatically uh, our nation has changed and how it's becoming um, more predominantly obese is becoming a more, obesity is becoming a more predominant problem. Look at our map in 1990. There's not a state in the United States that has obesity or rates of obesity, and that means a BMI of 30 or above. That's above 10 to 14 percent in 1990. In fact, we have four states, oh, excuse me, no data, but we have many states that are under 10 percent. By the year 2000, many of these states have obesity rates of 15 to 19 percent, many more 20 to 24 percent. Look at this today. The entire south, southern part of our country almost, has obesity rates of greater than 30 percent. Many other states, as you can see in the orange, burnt orange color, 
have 25 to 29 percent obesity rates. In fact, the lowest obesity rates are only 20 to 24 percent. So we don't have any states down here at this end anymore. California's in that 20 to 24 percent of us are obese. Um, that's a sad state for our nation, and uh, many uh, people say that perhaps the next generation won't live as long because obesity is going to make them prone for diseases such as diabetes, which are life-shortening um, diseases. Uh, a few years ago, I found this study, and it's sort of the only study I found that directly looked at the effect of obesity on brain. And what these authors did is that they looked at a group of about 94 older adults, and they divided them into their BMI. So you had overweight, obese, and normal. And they did brain scans. And what they were interested in looking at is were there particular areas of the brain that were affected, particularly by the obesity and being overweight. And what they found, and the, the changes are shown in the shaded areas, but what you're looking at, this is a side view of the brain. So the person's nose would be out here, their eyes about here. And so this is the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobes are involved in what we call executive functions. And these would be things like organization, planning, multitasking, um, decision making. There were some changes, a loss of brain cells in the frontal lobes shown on this side view. And this is a top view. So you're looking down on the person. Their nose would be here, their ears on either side. And you can see there was a loss of brain tissue in the obese individuals in the frontal lobes involving these executive functions. This is a side view of the brain. Uh, a front view, so you're sort of looking at the person straight ahead, and now they're slicing the brain like a loaf of bread going from the front to the back. So the person's ears would be about here. This is the temporal lobe, and there's an area called the hippocampus that's particularly involved in the formation of memories. And in individuals who were obese, in their study, they showed atrophy or shrinkage in the size of the hippocampus and temporal lobe. So that's going to affect memory and learning. They also showed changes in what's called the white matter of the brain, which are tracks that sort of provide a way for information to pass from one side of the brain or from front to back, et cetera. And there was a loss of brain cells in these tracks, which would then result in a slowing down in their speed of information processing, so they'd be slower at thinking. Interestingly, when they took all of this into consideration, the shrinkage in the brain, what they showed is that essentially overweight, obese individuals had about 8% less brain tissue than someone their same age who was of normal weight. If you're overweight, not obese, you had about a 4% loss. As I mentioned earlier, as we get older, our brain shows some shrinkage. And so those people who are obese, their brains actually looked about 16 years older than they actually were. And the people who were overweight, their brains looked about eight years older than they were actually. Interestingly, these changes in the cognitive processing was not seen in the overweight. It was primarily in the obese. They were looking at uh, structural scans so they could actually sort of measure the amount of brain tissue that was decreased. It wasn't a metabolic scan like a PET scan. This was looking at the structure, how much cells were lost. So this would be like an MRI. All right. Go. So um, an interesting study that looked at the relationship between weight and dementia risk these were looking at individuals in, the first one is in midlife, so these were people who were middle-aged. It was done at Kaiser Permanente, and they actually looked at over 10,000 individuals. And they 
initial assessments they did when these individuals were in their 40s to 45, and they followed them for 27 years. And they looked at how many of these individuals would develop dementia. And they looked at their weight in middle age. And they looked at the weight both by BMI and by sort of looking at the thickness of skin fold. So it's where they would take sort of the skin and measure how much sort of floppy it was, how much excess skin was there. And what they found is that if you were obese, BMI greater than 30 and middle age, the risk of developing dementia 27 years later was 74%. If you were overweight at middle age, the risk was 35%. Uh, so simply being overweight, because they also controlled for other cardiovascular risks, though they controlled for hypertension, cholesterol, smoking, they were primarily focused on obesity, and so being overweight does increase the risk in later life of developing dementia. Uh, particularly important, uh, or seems to, um, import, particularly important factor in terms of uh, weight and risk for dementia is what we call central obesity, basically belly fat, and that uh, carrying your weight around your middle increases risk for uh, dementia. Again, in this study, um, they control for other medical factors, just like the study Malcolm just described for you, and they found that um, if you even had a normal weight, but you had a large belly, that almost doubled your risk. And if you were obese and you had a large belly, you can see that almost quadrupled your risk for developing a dementia. So we're going to move on now and talk about diet. Mm -hmm. And one of the most popular topics is the omega-3 in fish. And so you probably know that omega-3s are one of the polyunsaturated fats. Um, and there's two kinds of these polyunsaturated fats that are often talked about. There's the omega-3s and omega-6s. And so the omega-3s are uh, not produced by the body, but we get it through our diet. And the main source of the omega-3s would be fish, particularly cold water fish, um, such as salmon, sardines, tuna, uh, trout. Omega-3s have two main components, and I'm not going to, I never can pronounce them, so don't expect me to <laughs> pronounce them. but. Uh, there's EPA and DHA. And both of these are what you can get from fish. There's also another type of omega-3. This is called ALA. And this comes primarily from plants. And ALA is, um, you have to, ALA has to be broken down and converted into this EPA and DHA, and it's not a very efficient method. So you can get some of this omega-3 from plants. Um, I forget the plants. Flaxseed? Uh, um, no, but walnuts. Walnuts. Right here, flaxseed, oh. dark green leafy vegetables. And, you know, again, through this process, ALA will convert into some DHA, but it's very inefficient, so it's not an effective way to get a high level of omega-3s. So um, we're going to talk about fish in specific, but then also uh, supplements. Are they a good alternative or not for fish? But the, the bottom line is that this DHA and EPA is very important for helping your brain cells to maintain their membranes to help them to remain healthy. It's also important for the communication of brain cells. And probably one of the, the first and maybe the classic study that looked at the benefit of a diet that had fish was done by Morris and her colleagues about 2003. And what she did is she um, looked at a group that was about 815 seniors. These were people in their 60s to 90s. And she followed them for four years. 
And during that time, she had them complete on a regular basis uh, questionnaires about their diet, sort of dietary questionnaires. And then she looked at the end of the four years how many of these healthy adults had converted to dementia. And what she found was that if in their diet they had consumed fish at least once a week, they had essentially a 60% reduced risk of developing dementia during that four-year span. Uh, if you ate more than once a week, it was about the same reduction, about a 60% reduced risk. And they included in their diet anything that was fish. So it could be fish as a main course, it could be fish sticks, it could be a tuna fish sandwich. So any kind of fish they found was beneficial in terms of reducing the risk. So what is the goal here? Uh, if you're a healthy older adult, the goal is to aim for, as the slide says, two non-fried, it's a key word here, servings of fish, uh, preferably such as uh, salmon. Um, of course, there are exceptions uh, for high-risk gr groups like pregnant women that shouldn't be eating uh, tuna due to mercury level. We know and research has shown now that um, really frying the fish uh, does take away uh, the benefit. Many people worry about consuming fish like salmon because of the potential uh, contaminants. Actually, uh, two things to say about that. The best way to resolve that and to minimize c contaminants is actually to make sure you skin your fish before you cook it. The majority of contaminants in fish like salmon is actually in the uh, skin. Uh, also, you have in your handout, we're going to talk about the Mediterranean diet in a little bit, so you have a nice colorful Mediterranean diet chart, but on the back of that you're going to find a little guide on fish and mercury levels and how much you can ba eat based on your weight. Um, so there are many guides on the internet though. Um, there's a couple given in this slide where you can go on and you can um, look at uh, the various contaminant levels and mercury levels in fish and make sure uh, that you're uh, safe in how you're consuming these foods. Um, fish, uh, excuse me, fish, fish oil tablets. So are fish oil tablets um, a good way to get fish oil? Actually, um, we're not sure how good they are in terms of their uh, benefits. Um, they certainly are an alternative for people who can't tolerate fish. Um, we would recommend uh, that you aim for a daily dose of 500 milligram. And so again, you can look on the back of the bottle and it'll tell you how much EPA plus DHA specifically is in the tablet. Um, and then higher doses for people with heart disease or heart failure because we again know that fish oil helps to lower blood pressure, uh, for example. But one of the reasons um, we're not sure and the evidence is mixed is because uh, fish, all the benefits of fish, all the various uh, vitamins, nutri nutrients, and so forth may not all be in the oil. Um, so there may be other nutrients and vitamins that you're getting in the food that you can't get in the fish oil tablet, and some recent um, research suggests that might be the case. So there's evidence about a diet that is high in fish. It may help reduce cholesterol. It certainly seems to help reduce a, another type of flat fat in our bloodstream called triglycerides. Um, it also helps to protect the brain cells and improve communication amongst the brain cells. So there seems to be some cardiovascular benefits of fish, and so the FDA in 2000 sort of allowed uh, pharmaceutical companies and supplement makers to sort of put on their labels that EPA and DHA may help essentially have some cardiovascular benefits. And then 2004, the FDA allowed uh, food manufacturers to put on their 
cartons that EPA and DHA were associated with sort of, quote, a heart-healthy diet. Well, in the last two months, October and November of this year, there's been a couple of studies that have been released that sort of threw some cold water on the idea about fish oil maybe being equivalent to fish. And um, one of these studies, it's called the Origin Study, they looked at over 12,000 older adults who were taking either 1,000 milligrams of DHA and EPA versus a placebo. And they followed them for six years. And they were essentially looking, oh, these individuals also had either diabetes or they were pre-diabetic. And over the six years, they looked at the death rate from cardiovascular incidents, either like a major stroke, heart attack, uh, congestive heart failure. And what they found at the end of the study is that there was no difference between the people on the fish oil and those on a placebo who died from some major cardiac event or any cause of cardiac mortality. So there didn't seem to be a benefit by just taking the fish oil, which makes sense. You shouldn't assume that if you just pop a fish oil, you don't need to change anything else in your diet and you'll be protected. The other study, it was a, actually, it was in the Cochrane Reviews and the Cochrane views, I don't know if you've ever looked at them, but they are um, sort of very prestigious reviews written by experts in the field that evaluate certain topics. And one of the topics they evaluated just recently was fish oil. And they looked at the benefit of fish oil for cognitive functioning in three well-done studies that were called placebo-controlled, randomized, double-blind studies. So this is where individuals either got the fish oil or they got a placebo. The doctors didn't know what they were getting. The patients, individuals, didn't know what they were getting. And what they did is they looked over a span of time, and it, it varied from just half a year to up to four or more years in these healthy adults. And they looked at their performance on cognitive tests. And unfortunately, they didn't see any benefit of the fish oil in terms of performance on memory tests, on tests of executive functioning like planning, organization, reasoning, or in terms of speed of information processing. So there didn't seem to be any benefit of EPA and DHA in terms of cognitive functioning. And they also, in that earlier study, there was no, seemed to be no benefit for reducing risk of cardiac or cardiovascular death. So I think simply adding fish oil to a diet, should, you shouldn't sort of assume that it's going to help you along cognition or cardiovascular. Well, I think that's really important about all the different things that we're talking about. None of them, as the slide said, are really a magic bullet. No one thing is a magic bullet, and it certainly doesn't appear that just taking a fish oil tablet is a magic bullet. As well, fish oil tablets can affect um, blood clotting. So like all supplements, you should never take these supplements without talking to a doctor. Go ahead. Okay. Well, um, another supplement that's often mentioned are the antioxidants. These are vitamin C, vitamin E, et cetera. And what they're designed to do is they're essentially trying to neutralize uh, unbalanced molecules. These are called free radicals. So free radicals are not college professors at Berkeley, but they're these, <laughs> they are these um, unbalanced molecules. Well, how do you get these unbalanced molecules? Well. This is just a normal part of life. These molecules can become unbalanced or become free radicals simply by breathing. Also exposure to ultraviolet light through sunlight, uh, smoking, pollution, they can cause these imbalanced molecules. So you can think of these imbalanced molecules as sort of like garbage accumulating in your neural system. And what the free radicals are, they're like garbage trucks. They come around and scoop up this damaged molecules or the free radicals. 
And normally in our system, we have a mechanism to operate these garbage trucks. It's through our diet and it's these antioxidants. But sometimes there can be so much damage that it sort of overwhelms the garbage truck system. Um, and in that case, you talk about the level of oxidative stress or damage that's going on in the brain. So one of the interesting findings is when they look at the blood levels of antioxidants in patients who have MCI and Alzheimer's disease, many studies showed lower than expected levels of antioxidants in their blood system. So the logic would be as if you've got low levels of these antioxidants, then if we were to give you supplements, antioxidant supplements, would that raise the level of the antioxidants and maybe help to slow the disease or maybe reduce the risk of developing the disease. So should we take antioxidant supplements? Well, um, it really depends. You can see here one study that involved almost 5,000 older adults um, that if you took antioxidant vitamins, and this particular vitamins E and C together, um, it had reduced the risk for dementia by 64 percent. So one, again, being the comparison point uh, of not taking any um, vit vitamins at all, um, it reduced uh, risk greatly. Uh, it's interesting that uh, if you just took vitamin C at all, a C by itself, um, it didn't have the same effect. Uh, multivitamins alone uh, had a much less effect. Um, vitamin E reduced risk by 53% um, uh, there. So the greatest benefit was by taking these vitamins in combination. But there is some um, risk here that we're going to talk about in just a minute. Uh, first, another study uh, involving nearly 5,400 participants, older adults, again, who were followed for nearly 10 years, um, taking vitamin E, reduced risk again in this study. Um, whereas, again, just like it's in the other study, vitamin, uh, excuse me, um, did I say that correctly? Yes. Um, just like in the other study where our vitamin C uh, alone um, did not increase, increase uh, excuse me, decrease um, your risk. Um, and in this case, um, the intake was from food sources uh, only versus uh, supplements. So uh, you can see that the higher levels of vitamin E in the blood were associated with 45% uh, uh, decreased uh, risk of dementia. So it looks, those kinds of studies look very positive. So we know that in Alzheimer's and MTI patients had lower levels of blood antioxidants. So maybe we should give them either through diet or supplements, try to raise that level of the antioxidants. Then in 2005, there was a study that got a lot of press by Edgar Miller and his colleagues at the John Hopkins School of Medicine. And he did a meta-analysis where he took data from 19 separate studies. And what he found was that high levels of antioxidants uh, actually could increase the risk for mortality. So, uh, and low levels actually may be beneficial. Now, there was, so he was saying essentially you have to use caution in using antioxidants because too much can actually increase the risk of death. Uh, at the time, many centers that were dealing with Alzheimer's disease, it was a common practice to recommend that individuals be on high doses of antioxidants. In fact, many were using the results of a study done by Mary Sano that we talked about when we talked about treatment that was recommending 2,000 international units of vitamin E a day. And if you look at a, a typical uh, bottle of multivitamins, what you find is that the recommended amount of vitamin E is probably around 15 international units and places were recommending 2,000. There were some problems with this meta-analysis done by Miller. One is that the majority of studies that he was looking at were using patients who were actually very sick 
Many of them had cardiovascular problems or they had uh, Parkinson's disease or they had other health issues. So the generalization of his findings about high doses may be um, a risk for mortality, may it does, perhaps it doesn't apply to healthy adults. But still, you have to be cautious about using these high doses of, mul of antioxidants. So should you take antioxidant vitamins? Well, I think only you and your doctor really can decide that. And so your doctor needs to, that needs to be a discussion. So we wouldn't recommend just going out and starting taking mega doses because it can have some negative side effects. Also vitamin E is a blood thinner. So it could interact with medications if you're on a potential blood thinner like Coumadin or uh, high dose aspirin, it could worsen that blood thinning effect. Now there's, uh, I've, I don't know if you're like us, but we always get these flyers in the mail touting various memory boosters and uh, supplements that you can take that will either boost up your memory or they'll prevent or lessen the risk of cognitive decline. And this is a big business in the United States. Uh, it's estimated that by next year, consumers will spend over two billion dollars a year on these sort of memory boosting supplements. And this I think reflects that concern we talked about at the very beginning about the aging of our population, particularly the baby boomers who are maybe concerned about their memory loss. Well, uh, do these supplements really work? Uh, <coughs> If you ever look at the advertisements on TV or in these flyers, nearly all of the evidence is based on testimonials, positive testimonials. Uh, I've never seen one that had negative testimonials. <laughs> or they never have said how many testimonials they had to do in order to get the positive ones. So did they have to interview a, a hundred people and maybe they got ten positive and ninety negative? But it gives the impression that these are going to be beneficial for your memory and maybe lessen the likelihood of developing into some kind of cognitive impairment. Well, uh, the problem is that these do not have very much evidence showing they're beneficial. It's mainly best based on testimonials. <coughs> I don't know of any of these uh, memory boosting supplements that have actually had a rigorous scientific clinical trial like we would use for testing medications that are double blind, randomized, you get the supplement, you get a placebo, and very few of them use any kind of objective measures of memory or thinking. They just sort of rely on the person saying, oh, my memory was much better after six weeks on brand X than it was before. Also, the contents of these supplements, they're not monitored by the FDA, so you never know actually what you're getting. And there could be a lot of contaminants in these supplements, particularly some have been shown to carry heavy metals like mercury. And the other big problem is that these supplements, the ingredients, either by themselves or con combined with others, can cause side effects and they may n interact in a negative way with certain medications. These are some of the, the, if you look at the ingredients, they'll often mention the DHA and the EPA, and we've already talked about how that large study just released a month or so ago didn't find any benefit in cognition. Other components are things like acetyl L-carnitine, uh, Huperzine A, ginkgo, uh, ginseng, all of these are ingredients and in the table you can see while acetyl L-carnitine and huperzine A, they're sort of, the idea is that they would work similar to a drug like Aricept and there are some studies looking at huperzine A that were done in China that maybe had some beneficial effects for Alzheimer's patients. But these drugs can produce a wide variety of side effects. And we've listed them on the, on the handout here. 
The one we is probably often seen in many of these supplements is ginkgo. And so ginkgo is um, an herbal supplement. It comes from a tree native to China. Uh, it's been touted as a way to improve concentration and memory. Uh, ginkgo is actually a prescription medicine in Europe. Uh, the prior to the onset of availability of Aricept, ginkgo was a prescription drug given for treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Well, uh, what does it do? Well, the next slide shows the results of a very large study that was done by the National Institute of Health and Aging. They tested the benefits of ginkgo in older adults. They had over 3,000 older adults. Most of them were healthy adults. Some had mild cognitive impairment. And what they did is they gave 240 milligrams of ginkgo per day, which is sort of typical of the recommended dose. And they, over a six-year span, they tested these individuals who either got a placebo or they got ginkgo with cognitive tests. Uh, they did a complete assessment every six months for six years. And what they were interested in looking at would, in these older adults taking ginkgo, would it lessen or reduce the risk of developing dementia over that six-year span? And the results are shown in the bottom here, where there was essentially no benefit whatsoever from ginkgo in reducing the risk of developing into dementia. So ginkgo was proven, and these kinds of studies will never be replicated. It was very expensive for the National Institute of Health to test it. No pharmaceutical company or herbal supplement company is going to fund this kind of research. But so this is a, a very well done study showing no benefit of this supplement. So we only have a little bit over 10 minutes left. So we have quite a bit of material to go through, so we're going to have to go quite quickly through the next uh, following points. Um, but there are some things that we really want to highlight. Um, and first of all, I want you to just pay attention to the Mediterranean diet. Uh, many of you may have heard about the Mediterranean diet, and I gave you a larger handout of this triangle, so you can see that the Mediterranean diet um, is rich in vegetables, whole grains, and oils like olive oils, um, and where you eat more fish than you would eat uh, red meat, uh, and that some alcohol is allowed, and it encourages daily physical activity. What's interesting is there have been several studies now, this is one example, where um, the degree to which you followed the Mediterranean diet was examined. And this particular study with approximately 2,300 um, seniors in New York, you can see that those who most closely adhered to this particular diet were at 40 percent less risk uh, for Alzheimer's disease. And there have been subsequent studies that have found similar results. We're now going to speak briefly about physical activity. and. Um, I think just uh, we put information on the slide, but essentially the, the amount of physical activity and exercise that's been recommended has changed dramatically over the last 30 to 40 years. The old idea of uh, no gain, no pain, no gain, where you had to really exert yourself uh, in physical exercise to see a benefit in terms of your uh, cardiovascular system and, and brain functioning. That's gone away. And now the typical recommendation is to do some kind of like aerobic exercise, walking, for example, about 30 minutes or longer most days of the week. So it's not so much the level of exertion, but the amount of time you spend. And they would recommend sort of a moderate level of exertion. So what is that? That's where if you're walking with a friend, you can engage in a conversation with them, but by the end of the 30 minutes, you're a little bit winded. So it doesn't mean you have to be a marathon runner. It's just a moderate level of intensity. So we're just going to highlight a couple of studies here to show the importance of exercise. And it's never too late to start exercising. So this particular study actually looked at 
seniors, 65 plus, um, over six years, and found that if they were exercising just three days a week for only 15 minutes at a time, um, it reduced their risk for dementia by a third. Um, and these, again, weren't strenuous exercises. Again, included things like walking and stretching, uh, aerobics, as well as more challenging um, weight training. Uh, in another study, again, emphasizing all you need to do is take a walk. Both of these studies show that regular walking can reduce your risk for dementia. One done with older women, where risk was reduced by 20%, and the other by, uh, with older men, um, who uh, had a 41% reduced risk of dementia. So just going out and taking a regular walk at least three times a week for 30 min minutes 1.5 hours there is uh, something that is easily doable and could help reduce your risk. Additionally, um, studies have looked at how active we are in midlife, and this particular study did just that, um, following nearly 1,500 people for 35 years. And those who you can see exercise twice a week. When they became older adults, they were at a 62% lower risk for dementia. And again, walking and cycling. Um, so just take a walk. And finally, because of uh, lack of time, just quickly, um, again, as Malcolm said when he was talking about supplements, there's no magic bullet. And I think what's interesting is now we're seeing studies that are looking at doing things together. So this particular study looked at diet and exercise. And you can see, um, again, 1,200 older adults nearly, and uh, interviewed about their diet and exercise. And you can see the ones who, uh, whose risk was um, most reduced for those who exercised regularly and adhered most closely, again, to the Mediterranean diet, 60% reduction in risk versus just um, using the Mediterranean diet at 40% and just exercising at 33%. So doing these things in combination is very important. Another okay. risk factor is head injury. And so we do know from multiple studies that if you're an older adult who has a head injury, uh, particularly with the loss of consciousness, that you are 2.8 or higher times risk of subsequently developing dementia. Mm -hmm. And this risk is particularly uh, increased if you happen to have one of the APOE, APOE gene type 4, uh, which we talked about when we talked about the, uh, some of the issues related to dementia diagnosis. So if you have this risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and you have a head injury with loss of consciousness, it can raise the risk up to seven times or higher. Right. APOE4 is simply um, a genetic risk factor that increases your risk. Um, and many of you have probably heard, um, it's been widely uh, out in the news and on the internet about the relationship between uh, concussions, uh, sports-related trauma, and even sub-concussive injuries, and how that increases risk uh, for dementia. You can see um, among this particular uh, group of uh, retired players, 6.1% uh, had dementia symptoms, and that's higher than the national average. The national average is just 1.2%. So um, players 30, not 30 to 49, again, you can see the data there, um, dementia-related diagnoses, uh, 19 times higher than the national average at that particular age range. Mental activity. So I think it's important to notice that activity, physical, mental, and social activity are all important for your brain. And uh, Malcolm is going to, he promises me, very briefly explain the brain, uh, the brain well, reserve hypothesis, or we're going to be here till 7 o'clock. Well, I was wondering, should we just skip the brain reserve We could hypothesis? skip the brain reserve hypothesis because... We'll hold that off for another presentation. We will. 
But basically, basically, it, it very lies. in a short in, message, in, one it, sentence, it, one uh, sentence. I challenge you. Well, <laughs> I can do what it. it does. It allows you to explain why, for example, at our clinic, we'll have people who are functioning as a healthy older adult, and they come into the clinic. They um, are doing well, and they pass away, and we look at their brain, and their brain is full of plaques and tangles. And why did they not show the symptoms? And it's because they overthrew their innate intelligence, their uh, life experiences, their education. They developed a very complex network of interconnections that allowed them to withstand the damage from the plaques and tangles. And if you compare that to somebody who has a less cognitive reserve, a less elaborate network, then it, it helps to explain why you can have individuals who look like they're functioning well and yet their brain shows pathology, and also why these highly educated, well, highly functioning individuals, when they do get dementia, it often leads to a very rapid decline within a short span of time. But uh, we'll have to hold off that until another time. That was four sentences. I know. <laughs> All right, um, so the main message is turn off the TV and be mentally active. And this study, and you see the details there, showed that when they looked at seniors who developed Alzheimer's and those who didn't and how they were spending the leisure time, seniors who developed Alzheimer's were spending more time sitting in front of the TV. So got to get off the couch. Um, and this study very quickly with 5,500 Chinese Americans looked at what kind of activities these individuals um, participated in. They compared individuals who developed cognitive impairment against those who did not develop cognitive impairment. And guess what? People who became cognitively impaired in this study were watching TV twice as many hours as people who weren't. And this is hours per week. So nearly 30 hours per week of watching TV. On the other hand, the people who stayed cognitively healthy were reading three times, excuse me, playing board games three times as much as those who became cognitively impaired. The ones who stayed healthy were also reading four times as many hours, or four times as long, as those who became cognitively impaired. And um, it's really a combination of both physical activity and mental activity that seems to be very beneficial. And this one study, they looked at in midlife, they looked at inactivity, people who were not exercising and were not doing things to stimulate the brain, and they found an increased risk for Alzheimer's by 250 percent. So also social activity is key. So staying connected with other people, and here are several studies again all of them demonstrating the less socially active, the less socially connected you are, the greater your risk uh, for um, dementia. And um, being lonely and being emotionally lonely by that, uh, feeling abandoned, uh, feeling empty, missing your friends, um, also Oh, that's, ah, but I have that same ring. I apologize. I'm like, oh, did I forget to turn off my phone? Um, <laughs> these people, these people also were at twice the risk, but more frequent activity and social connection decreased their risk. And finally, just one slide on, one slide, I believe, maybe two, on depression and stress. Um, again, there's two studies here. This one shows that if you have a long history of depression, a lifelong history, you um, started with depression uh, prior to age uh, 60, you're four times greater risk. If you develop depression as an older adult, your uh, risk is still doubled. Um, and here again, another study uh, showing that depressed individuals, older adults here, were nearly two times as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. Depression is a very treatable disease. It has a lot of stigma. People often don't like to admit it. It's very treatable with medication and counseling. Oh, do your evaluations if you're leaving, please. And uh, finally, stress also um, 
it increases our risk significantly in this particular study involving women who were followed over 35 years. Their, their risk for dementia increased from 10% to 151% based on uh, the level of uh, stress. And again, reiterating the point about um, depression. And so we want to do all these things together, um, all the things we've talked about today, controlling our medical risks, maintaining a healthy weight and diet, physical, mental, and social activity, and getting a good night's sleep is also important to our brain. So unfortunately, there is no miracle pill or supplement you can take. It's through you actually being active and making a difference in your life through these exercises, doing things that will stimulate you cognitively, going to your doctor, making sure your cardiovascular risks, hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, if you have it, is well under control. Also, one thing that I just realized that I forgot to announce at the beginning, and I had promised the Alzheimer's Association I would do that, and better late than never, <laughs> is that uh, the Alzheimer's Association is going to have a very special event. It's actually coming up uh, Thursday, uh, and it's a presentation on frontotemporal dementia with an expert in the area, Dr. Mario uh, Mendez, along with Jill Shapira, a nurse practitioner. Um, this is a special event because the Alzheimer's Association is actually going to be giving three research awards. Those three research awards are all going to UCI Mind researchers. We are so proud of that. Um, Dr. Kim Green, Dr. Matthew Blurton Joan, and Dr. Vitali. Velaski, I said that wrong, I know, because it was, Viarella Help me say it again. Yes, of course, wow. right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Dr. Vivi, uh, um, so we are so proud of that, and I sounds like space is still available, and if you'd like to do, talk to, um, if you'd like to go to this, you can RSVP, you can get one of these flyers from our Alzheimer's Association representative in the back of the room. So with that, um, does anybody have a quick question or two? Yes, go ahead. Um, I read a study from China that implicated fluoride in water and also I read things uh, about formaldehyde. What about contaminants and pesticides? How do they affect the development of Alzheimer's and dementia, you know? Well, I, I don't know about those studies with Alzheimer's, but certainly insecticides, herbicides, pesticides, uh, exposure to those have been associated with Parkinson's disease. I do want to reiterate, because I see people having to leave, we do really appreciate your completing the evaluation. The feedback is important to us. If you could do that before you step out, um, that would be so helpful. Yes, in the back. Malcolm, I couldn't hear that. Uh, the question was, would it? using low doses of silver, the metal, help? Uh, I, I've not heard of anybody doing that, and so I, I would doubt it, but you, you know, you should always run these questions by your primary care doctor if you have a question, but I've never heard of using silver. All right, there's another question, oh, just a moment. There's another question over here that's been waiting. Yes, it does. Fish oil um, does affect blood clotting, and so if you are taking Coumadin, again, this is something where you should be talking to your doctor. Um, if you are taking fish oil, let him know, and he can make that judgment of what's safe for you. Uh huh. Uh, okay, well, we're going to wrap it up. We'll be here for a few more minutes if anybody has any individual questions. Thank you again so much for coming. If you want to be on our mailing list and you want to come to the series next year, make sure to fill one of these out so we'll get you on our future mailings.